Welcome to the Asian Tapestry. Welcome to the Asian Tapestry, a podcast about myths, legends, and lore from Asia, structured in a book-like format called The Book of Fables. It's good to be back from hiatus, and thank you all so much for joining me and supporting me through it all. I really appreciate everyone who continued to listen throughout the hiatus, and thank you for listening now. Our last chapter was a Persian tale called Muhammad of the Bow, slaying with his arrow two lions with one blow. Muhammad was a shawl weaver who somewhat accidentally, and very humorously, became a renowned archer. A similar to stories such as Kara Mustafa, a Turkish tale, and the brave little tailor, a brother's grim fairy tale. If you enjoy those tales, please head over to chapter 4 and have a listen. Today's tale is a ghostly story from Bengal, so stay close and come with me as we journey to Bengal. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a Brahmin who lived with his mother. They were poor people with just enough money to get by. More than anything, the Brahmin wished for a wife to love, a wife who would help his aging mother, a wife to have children with. But he did not have the money for a wedding, and so his mother wept bitterly every evening, afraid that once she was gone, her son would be left all alone. One day, the Brahmin decided to go from door to door, charming and flattering many of the wealthy dwellers in their town. At first, the people were wary and turned him away. But soon, they realized how honest, charming, and genuinely funny he was, and began giving him small amounts of money. After months and months of this, the Brahmin finally scraped together enough money for his wedding. As luck would have it, during these months of traveling door to door, the Brahmin had met a young woman called Anushri, who sold vegetables and fruit at her stall every morning in town. He would stop at her stall and speak at length to her, and soon found that he had grown extremely fond of seeing her every day. And so he proposed marriage, obtained her family's blessings, and soon the wedding took place. His mother was overjoyed and doted on her son and her new daughter-in-law. For her part, Anushri settled into wedded life well, and for a time they were happy. But soon the money began to dwindle, and the inconsistent and insufficient income the Brahmin got from repairing roofs and mending furniture was simply not enough to sustain the entire family, especially after Anushri fell pregnant. So the Brahmin gathered all his money, thankfully a decent sum for the moment, and gave it all to Anushri and his mother. Ma, take this money and take care of Anushri yourself and my child when it is born, the Brahmin told his mother. I need to leave so that I can earn money for us. I do not know when I'll be back, but I'll send money home as often as I can. His mother tearfully blessed him and his travels, and so the Brahmin left after kissing his wife goodbye. However, that very evening, the Brahmin appeared to return and entered his house. As he came in, Anushri stood in surprise and rushed up to him. Dear husband, she exclaimed, why have you returned so early? Is everything all right? she asked, bewildered. The Brahmin embraced his wife. Everything is fine. I have managed to secure work and still stay here with you, Anma. Anushri and the Brahmin's mother were overjoyed at this news, and all was well. But little did they know that it was not the real Brahmin who had returned, but a ghost in the form of him. He looked like the Brahmin, acted like him, spoke like him, and did everything in the same manner as him. Everyone is fooled, even Anushri, his dear wife. So for many months, the ghostly Brahmin lived with Anushri and his mother. They were happy for most of the time. But soon after the birth of their first child, a happy little boy, Anushri began to wonder what had changed her husband. The Brahmin used to always speak about how much he wanted a son. Yet when their boy arrived, he did not show as much excitement and emotion as Anushri expected. He smiled and held the boy, but he was not truly affectionate, nor did he dote on his son. 
He had no interest in teaching him, and would often send him away to his mother. Even towards her, she noticed that his emotions were detached. Initially worried that perhaps not all was well with work, but he often brought money to them, so surely everything was fine. She then began to wonder that he was spending time with another woman, but could find no evidence for this, for he hardly left the house. She confessed her worries to her mother-in-law, who berated her for her doubts and told her to be happy that she had a husband who could provide for her. Secretly, however, the Brahmin's mother, too, was worried for her son, for he was no longer as attentive or respectful towards her as he used to be. Four years passed, and at last the real Brahmin returned home, eager and excited to see his beautiful wife and loving mother again, and he was practically bouncing on his feet at the thought of seeing his child. But when he threw open the door, the scene that met him made him stumble back in shock. There at the table sat his wife, his mother, and a man who looked just like him. The ghostly Brahmin shot out of his seat and pointed a finger at the Brahmin angrily. Who are you to barge into my house uninvited? But the Brahmin shouted back, Who am I? Who are you? This is my house, my wife, my mother, my son. You are the stranger here. But the ghostly Brahmin dismissed his words with a click of his tongue. What an odd thing to say. Ask anyone here, or will tell you that this is my house, my family. I have lived here for years and provided for my family for years. Who are you to come and question that? He turned towards Anushri and his mother for reassurance. His mother nodded, although her eyes flickered between the two men worryingly. Anushri frowned as she gazed at the real Brahman, noting the warmth and depth in his eyes as he gazed back at her. But the ghostly Brahman cleared his throat as he glared at her, and she stammered out her eyes downcast. Y yes, you have been providing for us for years, dear husband. The ghostly Brahman smiled smugly and turned back to the real Brahman. There, you see? Now get out of my house with your lies. And with these words, he drove the real Brahman out. The Brahman wandered here and there around the village, stunned to silence at his situation. Soon he found himself at a well, and sitting on the edge of it, gazed out at the town bustling around him. How did this happen to him? Was he mad? Then a shadow fell across him. And looking up, he cried out as he saw his wife in front of him. A Anushri! he cried out, reaching for her, but stopping short when he saw how hesitant she was. He let his arms fall to his side as tears blurred his vision. Anushri, he repeated. Please, you have to believe me. I am your husband. I don't know who that man is, but he is a liar. But she quickly pressed a finger to his lips to silence him, her gaze darting about them. Hush, husband. I know it is you. I have been suspicious of this copy for many years now, but did not know how to prove my suspicions until you came back. Listen to me now. You must go to the king and appeal that he take on this case. Perhaps he can banish this impostor. Anushri whispered urgently. I cannot stay long, or you will get suspicious of my absence. Hurry now, she hissed, pressing her hand into his briefly before hurrying away. The Brahmin looked down at his hands and realized that his wife had given him a small wooden sculpture of the donkey. He smiled. A toy of his sons, no doubt. It gave him hope and courage, and so the Brahmin set off to see the king. The king's servants ushered him in, and the Brahmin put his case to the king. The king was most perplexed, and soon called for the ghostly Brahmin. He looked between the two, back and forth many times, but could not see the difference. Eventually, he lost his patience and sent them both away. The next day, the Brahmin came back to the king and begged him to help, but the king simply told him to come another day, as he had not yet made his decision. Day after day, this continued, until the Brahmin was so frustrated he beat his head with his hand and cursed loudly. Why are the gods punishing me like this? What have I done to deserve this? He continued speaking to himself as he wandered out into the fields, until he suddenly realized that a group of young herders were staring at him with amused expressions. Why do you rant and rave like a wild man? One of the herders, barely a boy of fourteen, asked him. The Brahmin sighed heavily and explained his situation to the group of young boys. The eldest of the group seemed to ponder his words for a few minutes before nodding. Hm. Come, I will take you to the king. He will know what to do, the boy said. But the Brahmin scoffed. I have just come from the king, and he knows nothing. 
but the boy shook his head with a smile. Not that, king. I will take you to the herd, king. And with that, he led the Brahmin further down the field, until they approached a man of about eighteen, who stood next to his donkey, leaning on a spade. The herder explained to the herd king that the Brahmin had a very complex issue and needed help, and so the herd king agreed to listen. Once again, the Brahmin told his story. The herd king took some moments to think over the conundrum before him, and then nodded. Very well, Brahmin, I will solve your case. Only go to the king and ask his permission first, so that I do not trespass my boundaries. And the Brahmin, overjoyed, ran to the king and asked for his permission, which was readily given, as the king was entirely sick of listening to the Brahmin and his strange stories. And so, the herd king called together the Brahmin, the ghostly Brahmin, Anushri and his son, and the mother, as well as several of his own herders as witnesses. He asked each many questions, some general, some specific, and some personal. In all of them, the ghostly Brahmin chose correctly, much to the Brahmin's despair. At last, the herd king put up his hand for silence. I have heard enough. This will be solved like so, he said, producing a vial from his robe. Whichever of you can enter this vial will be declared the rightful owner of this house, the rightful husband of this woman, the rightful father of this boy, and the rightful son of this mother. Now, enter he cried out, and with a triumphant smirk, the ghostly Brahmin turned into a small insect and flew into the vial. All save the herd king gasped out in shock, but the herd king swiftly stopped the vial and held it out to the Brahmin with a soft smile. And there is your ghost, my dear Brahmin, as it is you throw this into the deepest corner of the ocean and return to your house and your family. And so the Brahmin, clasping the hands of the herd king with joy, thanked him, and rejoiced and happily embraced his family, kissing his wife and carrying his son on his shoulders, and holding his mother's hand between his own, and they all entered their house, where they lived happily ever after. And that brings us to the end of chapter 5. I hope you enjoyed that tale from Bengal as much as I did. I adapted the tale from Folk Tales of Bengal by the Reverend Lal Bahari Day, published in 1912. I expanded on many details, particularly the character of the Brahmin's wife, who did not have a name in the original source, so I named her Anushri, which I believe means pretty. I gave her more speaking lines, and created the story of the Brahmin meeting her at the vegetable store, as well as invented the scene where she approaches him by the well and gives him advice. I thought it would be nice to bring more of her story into the character. I also added in her pregnancy, um, I thought that there would be more at stake then uh, for him to go to actually leave the family for so many years to go find a job. And I also had her and the Brahmin's mother develop deep suspicions about the ghostly Brahmin. I just added that sort of realistic element to it. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed this tale and that you join me once more for chapter 6 next time. If you like what you hear, please take a few minutes to leave a review any way you can and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Come chat with me on Twitter and Instagram at AsianTapestry1, or email me at theagenttapestrypod at gmail.com. I'm always keen to hear story suggestions, recipe ideas, or any other random musings you may have. This podcast is a proud member of the Straight Up Strange Network, and please check us out via the link in the show notes. Intro music was Jalandar by Kevin McLeod, and outro music was Raga, dancing music by Akash Gandhi. Further details, including license information, can be found in the show notes. I have been your host, the Shira Brother, and you've been listening to The Asian Tapestry. Join me next time for Chapter 6 of The Book of Fables. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.